Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God. <coughs> Gracious God, be with us this day as we listen to and for your word. And may we put your word into practice now and always. Amen. Historically, people have viewed ministry as a calling. It takes a special kind of person, and my family tells me, oh, I'm special. It takes a special kind of person to go out into the world and be a pastor. This vocation can be hard. Sometimes the demands and the expectations put on a person of the cloth can be daunting. Let me give you an example. One day Mildred came to see her minister. He knew something was wrong the minute she came into the office. Mildred was a sweet lady in her 70s and usually was a delight, but not today. She came into the pastor's study and she burst into tears. She said, Reverend, I know that this request was above and beyond your pastoral duties, but I'm worried about my hearing. Could you lay hands on me and pray? I'm looking for a miracle. The minister got up from around his desk, put his hands on Mildred's ears, and prayed. And when he had said amen, he looked at Mildred and said, Is that better? How's your hearing? She said, I don't know, I don't go to court till Thursday. <laughs> Jesus commands all of us pastors or not, to go. And sometimes we don't see those words as a calling, but as a difficult thing to accomplish as we learn from the pastor in our story. So today we focus on the command given by Jesus in Matthew's Gospel that we are all to go. Matthew's Gospel has several characteristics that make it quite different and unique. It was written primarily for the Jewish person. Matthew wanted the Jewish population to know that every aspect of Jesus' life was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Matthew was not excluding anyone else. He was trying to get the Jewish nation to see Jesus as the Messiah. He talks a lot about the second coming of Christ. It is only in Matthew that we get the parable of the tenants, the wise and foolish virgins, and the sheep it's all focusing on that topic. Matthew's Gospel has a, do a dominant slant on Jesus as King. He begins his Gospel by showing that Jesus came from the lineage of King David. The wise men came looking for the one who was the King. Before Pilate, Jesus accepts the name of King. It is in Matthew that the name King of the Jews is affixed over his head at the crucifixion, and in today's reading, he says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Matthew tries to show and prove that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus will establish God's kingdom, and that Jesus is our King sent from God. This is something that all of us we do believe this. We believe that God so loved us that he gave us his son. We believe that Jesus is a living presence in our lives. We believe that Jesus' sacrifice no longer separates us from God. We believe that our lives should be lived with Jesus in the center of our hearts. And because we believe in Christ's power, we know that our faith is one of action. Christianity has never been, is not now, and never will be a passive, inert, submissive religion. 
our faith, our hearts, our lives are intricately woven so that we are ever moving, ever helping, ever touching, ever going for. In Mass goes God in Buddha, in Mass. In Matthew's Gospel, there it is, we are told to go forth and do the work of Jesus. And that command is backed up by the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit are mentioned in these verses. It is not just Jesus giving us the command. It is God and the Holy Spirit and the Son <coughs> working together. God, in that three-person persona of the Trinity, calls us to go out and serve. God the Creator, God the Son, the Redeemer, and God the Spirit, who is the Advocate. All that is God commands us to serve. And we, in turn, need to give all who we are in service to God. We know that Jesus walked the earth all those years ago. We know that He is fully God and fully human, and we know that His living presence is right here. We also know that God, our Creator, is with us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us, helping us to live those lives for God. Which means, among other things, that we have this strong commitment in our faith, and we see it as an opportunity to help, to serve, and to give in God's name. We do that when we follow this command to go out into the world. Jesus equips the disciples to go out into the world. He just doesn't say, go, I'll see you tomorrow. He equips them to go. In the message, which is Eugene Peterson's way of translating the Bible for us, this is what these verses say. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marked by baptism in the threefold name of Father, Son, and Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I will be with you as you do this day after day, right up until the end of the age. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, has all authority, and God has commanded us, called us, commissioned us, selected us, chosen us, and believed enough in us that we can go out, we can go and serve in God's name. When we believe in God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, we go because we have a mission to go. We go to be God's voice, which means we go to teach, to guide, to motivate <laughs> others, to be kind, to be compassionate, to talk to people, to listen to people. We go to study, we go to pray, we go to show God's love. We go with Christ, we are Christ's hands in this world. We go to serve, we go to heal, we go to build, to comfort, to embrace, to share. We go with hands that should be confident, hands that should be strong, hands that should be able to reach out by holding someone else's hand, by picking someone up, by putting things together. We need to show Christ's love. We go and serve with our hands. And we go because we have that wind of the Holy Spirit flowing through us, which means we, we march as one of God's disciples. We progress in God's directions. We walk to those that no one wants to walk with. We travel showing God's mercy and grace. And we move at the impulse of God's love. The Christian life is not an easy one to lead, but it's something that we must do, and we do it every day. We don't get weekends off from our faith, and we don't check into a hotel for two weeks from our faith because we're on vacation. We need to go every single day, and we are called to do this. There's 19 of the scripture today. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, I did a little digging a little research, a little word study, as pastors do. And I looked at the original text and the language, and I tried to find somewhere where Jesus said, go if you want to. Go when you feel like it. Go if it's your thing. Go for an hour and see what you think. Go or stay, I really don't care, it's up to you. I couldn't 
find any evidence anywhere that this going was an optional activity. Now, let's suppose that we as a church were together one day in Mount Carmel, and let's suppose that we got this letter from Jesus, and I'll read it to you. It says, Dear Christians, this is my commission to you. In fact, you may, may even call it a great commission. You are to go to all people everywhere and call them to be my disciples. You are to baptize them and teach them to obey everything I have taught you. And don't forget, I'll be with you always to help you, even to the end of the world. I will never leave you or forsake you because I love you. Please don't forsake me. Go with all my love, Jesus. Now, suppose as a group we read this letter, and instead of immediately jumping up from our chairs, we sent the following letter in return. Dear Jesus, we acknowledge the receipt of your recent communication. Your proposal is both interesting and challenging. However, due to a shortage of personnel, as well as several other concerns and personal considerations, we do not feel that we can properly emphasize your challenge at this time. A committee has been appointed to study the feasibility of the plan. We should have a report to bring to our congregation sometime in the future. You may rest assured that we will give this our careful consideration, and our board will be framed for you and your efforts to find additional disciples. We do appreciate your offer to serve as a resource person, and should we decide to undertake this project at some point in the future, we'll get back. It's funny because it's true and at the same time it's, it's a little absurd. absurd. Jesus calls us to go. Jesus gives us that command. And as hard as it is, as much as we feel we're not up to the task, we know as faithful Christians we need to go. And in these verses of scripture, Jesus also gives us things that will help us. First, he gives us his power. He says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And then he commissions them to go out. So when we go, we go forth with that power of God. We, we have these tools on our belt that God gives us in order for us to go and serve him. We have the Bible. We have prayer. We have churches. We have fellow Christians. We have directions from God, we have the guidance of Christ, and we have the assurance of the Holy Spirit. So when we go, we go with power. Second thing, we are given a task, a, a job to do. We are considered to go out and bring forth God's message to everyone we meet. And when we are doing that job as individuals and in the church, then we go. And in this church, I think we do this quite well. We go and support mission, both locally and globally. We organize and run food pantries. We cook and serve meals on wheels, and we work with the Salvation Army. We go and help our members so that they can live in their homes. We go and volunteer at many local charities. We go and teach and visit. We, we give money all over the world. We help the hungry. We, we serve families in the community extra at Christmas time. And I could go on and on. God gives us the task to go each day, and I am proud to say that this congregation does a very good job at going forth. And as long as we are individually making that decision every day to go forth, we, are, we match well, and we serve God every day. And I have to get away from this microphone. I don't know if I have any cord. Okay, that's as far as you get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my limit, but I'll stay here. I want to tell you a story about a, a minister who was a pastor at a church in Atlanta, Georgia. He served this church for about 10 years. And they loved him dearly. See how that works? Ten years loving dearly. <laughs> but, you know. He was given an opportunity to go for a couple months on a sabbatical to Australia. And the church was thrilled. They gave him a big going away dinner. They gave him a gift that he could use in Australia. They gave him little gag gifts at the dinner to send him on the way with loving and joyous hearts. 
And as the pastor was preparing that week to go to Australia, he had a visit from a member of his church. And the man said, I need to talk to you about something. He said, when I was a younger man, I was in Australia. I was in Sydney, right where you're going to. And I was in Australia, and something happened to me there that has forever changed my life. And I just want to share it to you because you're going there to study and to enhance God's work and so on and so forth. He said, I was, I was out at the King's Cross intersection, and I was just standing there minding my own business, and there was a tap on my shoulder. And when I turned around, I was face to face with a, a homeless person. Uh, a derelict. There was, there was no question. His hair was very unkempt. His clothes were very dirty. It looked like he had lived in them for years. And he had that, unfortunately, that unmistakable smell and odor that comes with a person who lives by their wits on the street. And he said, and as I reached for my wallet to give him some money, he brushed my hand away and he looked at me and he said, Mister, if you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And then he disappeared. He just left. And I went on my way, and I was so haunted by the question that I had to find the answer. I had to discover for myself, if I were to die tonight, where would I spend eternity? And I tried to answer that question. I tried, tried to research that question. I tried to, good conscience, live that question. And I came to the conclusion that the only way to do that was to become a Christian and gave my life to Christ. And so I did. And I did all those years ago. And I want you to know that every time I think of Australia, every time I hear that accent, every time I see a picture, I think of that man who asked me that question and forever changed my life. And when the pastor heard this, he was filled with joy and he was filled with worry all at the same time. Maybe even a little bit of fear. All the same. It was joyous because he loved hearing that story. He loved knowing that there were people out in the world doing God's work and bringing people to Christ and making things happen. But he was worried because before he got on the plane, three other members of his church came in and told him almost an identical story. Four different people all being in that intersection, all being asked that question, and all of them having their lives changed. The bathroom. So the minister decided. He got to his hotel, he got to where he was studying, he figured he wasn't far from the intersection, so he was going to go there night after night and see if the same thing would happen to him. And so he goes night after night, and finally one night he feels a tap on his shoulder, and he's so excited that this could be the man that all those people talked about, that he turned around to face him. And before the man, the homeless man, could ask his question, the pastor blurted out. He looked at the man and said, If you were the guy tonight, why would you spend eternity? And the homeless man was shocked. He said, How did you know that? And so the pastor told him the whole story who he was, why he was in Australia, all these people that had been, had been affected by what this homeless man had done. And the homeless man burst into tears. And he said, I gave my life to Christ years and years and years ago. But my burning question was, how do I serve God? I have nothing to give. I have nothing to offer. I'm a person that repels people. I don't bring them close to me. I make them run from me. What can I give? So I decided this was what I could do to go out and serve in God's name. And he said, and I'm crying because it's the first time in my life that I ever knew that it actually made a difference. God calls us to go. God doesn't care what we can't do. God only wants us to give ourselves to him, put ourselves in his hand, and do what we can. And let us pray that we can do that. Gracious God, be with us. Help us to go do whatever we can for your people now 